Hello and welcome to Audicident.live. I am uh, Jerome Lipovic. Welcome to welcome everyone. I feel very, very honored, very honored to host this webinar uh, with three oral <coughs> surgery rockstars, um, namely Radoslav uh, Yadach, Frank Zastro, and Joseph Shukrun. Uh, this conference is very huge because this is a long distance meeting where I'm broadcasting from Paris, France. Frank is in Dubai. Uh, while uh, Radoslav is in Poland and Joseph uh, is in the, on the French Riviera. So we are live and uh, that means that you can ask all your questions in the chats, whether you are on Facebook, on YouTube or on Instagram. And I would like to introduce now our guests, uh, our two moderators of the day. So first, Radoslav uh, Yadach, uh, you are a long time doctor in the Department of uh, Maxillofacial Surgery and uh, uh, a lecturer at the Medical University of uh, Rocklav. I am pronouncing right, Rocklav, yeah? Rocklav. Um, you are also the founder of the Oral Surgery Academy, which is today an international postgraduate school located in the dental clinic where you run. And uh, you are also an award-winning international lecturer and trainer. And Frank, now, uh, you also, as notorious, you are the founder of the edu educa educational platform uh, myimplantbusiness.com and an experience also oral surgeon. You are senior physician at Professor Fouad Kouri um, in the world famous clinic Schloss uh, Schell Schellenstein. Ah, it was a long time uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, talk uh, German. Schloss Schellenstein, is that right? Yeah. Perfect. In Germany, yes. And <laughs> since two, 2012, you are the owner of the, at the private clinic, uh, Dr. Zastro and colleagues in Wiesloch, Wiesloch, in Germany. You are an international speaker, of course, specialized in biological bone augmentation and the split bone technique of uh, Fouad Kouré. Uh, you are the founder of the international Facebook group Real Bone Builders. And uh, I, I do foster you, everybody, to subscribe to this group and to join, to join us on this Facebook group, Real Ball Builders, and you focus, uh, you focus on the bone and soft tissue reconstruction in complex cases. So first, I would like to, um, to give you the stage um, to, to you, Frank, to introduce this uh, special, uh, special webinar. We, we are in the, this special, this, is, this will be a special journey um, that will deal with osteoimmunology, something quite new, something quite new. Um, well, we are live. Please send you all your questions on the, on the chat again. And Frank, uh, you're on the stage. So first of all, Jerome, thanks so much for your introducing words. And uh, yeah, it's absolutely a great honor uh, to me to introduce with dear friend and uh, yeah, worldwide uh, webinar. We are meeting for now a long time. We are talking about uh, nothing less than a new game-changing science, which is called, like you have said already, Jerome, osteoimmunology. And uh, which has replaced osteology in several aspects. And uh, the creator and father of PRF, same time surgeon and anesthesiologist, Joseph Chukra and himself will tell what it is about and how it will impact also your daily work. And um, I just go now to my presentation. I hope I can change the picture already. Let's see. Yeah, here just a few impressions from two days ago here in Dubai with uh, my co-moderator and good friend uh, Rado Yadach. On this picture, also with our good friend uh, Ricardo Kern from Brazil. And um, yeah, on the next picture, a nice memory with uh, Joseph Chukron on a recent Congress in Sierra, where I first of all heard about this news. And I want to start now with uh, my presentation. And the question is, do we have everything under control in complex situations? And uh, I want to just go very quick through uh, one case um, because uh, what are the problems? We have sometimes problems with heart tissue. 
also with soft tissue. You see the small arrow where we have uh, some struggles. You see here soft tissue healing problem. And the question is, do we have everything under control? Or, yeah, do we have um, also to need more answers to important questions? And uh, I want to go for those of you quite quickly through a case now. And the question is, in the end of that, or it's more uh, a statement that we will have a problem we have to we are focusing on, and the answer to this question will be given by Joseph Chukron himself. So, so this was a case uh, in the right maxilla. You see here a referred patient with a failed augmentation um, uh, in the uh, in the right upper maxilla. And uh, for those of you who don't know the split bone yet just uh, to give you a few impression how it uh, looks like um, to do this augmentation but even with this in my opinion most predictable concept and techniques we have overall we are still struggling in few cases and uh, the question is um, yeah can we get even more predictable results um, by doing better that diagnosis and have, having maybe better criteria. The soft tissue approach we are uh, doing here is usually no crestal incision, but a semi-lunar tunnel approach into the vestibule to have no uh, crestal incision above the later augmentation. You see here the bone harvesting from the retromolar area with a micro saw, but you, it's also possible to do it with a, a piezo surgery or with a normal burr. You see here uh, the blocks. We are working in our clinic since uh, more than 12 years now with purely autogenous bone. So it's really a very biological concept. So the idea of this um, technique is to work not with full cortical blocks, but instead split them into thin bone plates and um, yeah, scrape them for collecting more chips which are needed for filling the gaps in between. I know we go through this concept now quite quickly, but um, yeah, for those of you who are more interested in getting more information at the end, I will give you uh, an inf information where you can get it. You have to remove the sharp edges from the plates and it's a very safe concept. Um, you need to know some rules um, how to do it, but afterwards it's uh, yeah, very safe, very predictable. And in my opinion, there is no way around when it comes to more advanced uh, <laughs> defects where you need results. You see here how we got around one centimeter of bone height. Um, the gaps are filled then with chips. That's the idea. This combination of the plates, also called curvates, and the, the, the container filled then with the chips. All the chips are purely autogenous, collected from the plates. So the better you condense it, the better bone quality you, you will have uh, afterwards. You're fixing then uh, a second buckle plate on it. Uh, we are working here with so-called right angle technique, while we are also having the parallel technique. And you see the very, very tension-free closure in the very end. So that's important, especially when we go for a bigger bone augmentation to have a very tension-free closure. And yeah, still what you see here in this case, it's uh, not uh, the standard, but we had here a healing problem. Still it worked out. So you see, even by having some necrosis, uh, we were uh, able to handle this. Um, complication, but maybe there are ways how to avoid that, or maybe to um, yeah find to reduce the risk for that. So after only four months, you see quite nice result, but not 100%. I want to show you from a slightly different angle. You see here that my arrow. Yeah, we have here some bone deficiency. So the goal was. Um, yeah, to 
get your 100 percent we are not satisfied with 90 percent so that's why we are, um, collected some more bone from the tuberosity and just re-augmented that area where we have not full regeneration of the bone and you see in the end now we have on the buccal side and on the palatal side quite a nice amount of uh, bone soft tissue augment uh, soft, soft tissue um, management is crucial. You see here apical reposition flap, and this was the situation before, and this was the situation afterwards. And yeah, the final result. And for those who think maybe that might be, and you want to get uh, more information, please just check out our. Uh, Instagram account. Um, you see here Dr. Frank Sestro. Just uh, um, follow this account and um, yeah, go on the link and you will find more information. And now I want to hand over with a question or the statement. Houston, we have a problem to my good friend, Radoslav Jan who will continue with the small of Tukran will give us some solutions and answers. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Joseph, Frank, it's a great pleasure and honor. And uh, you know what I'm thinking. Uh, about this cooperation, it was shock to me. So <clears throat> thank you and forgive me, I'm not shaved because just one hour ago I left from the airplane and came at home and uh, without the luggage because before I trip, in my trip to the Dubai, my luggage has lost in Beirut. So uh, my dears, uh, I got the uh, same protocols for similar cases. And I see that even I will do everything correct and I educate my patient how he should behave after, how to he should take care about the wound. From time to time, healing is different. And I don't know why. Because me and my patient, we did everything same like in another cases where the success <clears throat> And from time to time, something is going wrong. So I want to show you three cases, very fast. And after that cases, I think you will be provoked to ask yourself, what's going on? So what the fragile topic? Yes, that's what I want to say. And uh, first of all, I was really, really scared about the cell immunology what I what I know about the immunology as a oral surgeon not so much so maybe this is the time to discover that topic and that uh, uncover ground so let's try training of the mind to think okay so a few years ago I thought that Houston no problem here we are doing surgery going home and uh, statistically we've got good results but i'm still unhappy and i'm still suffering when i got one complication yes and i'm still thinking about this so look i want to show you nice boy eight years old no 12 years old and uh, that there was a decision for mandibulectomy because of CoT everywhere. Look, CoT took whole bone on the left side of mandibula, <clears throat> in the left maxilla, right maxilla, and the right mandibula. It was a Gorlin syndrome. But with my master in maxillofacial department, we decided to not hurt this patient, but just remove the cyst and leave that empty bone without any augmentation. Because 
the defect was bigger than uh, we could uh, collect the autogenous bone, in those times, there was not so easy, I think quite impossible, to find the frozen human bone from the bank. So look what happened. Just empty bone without calcioti. Everything starts to heal. Now he has got uh, 20, 24 years, I think. And look, we, we did only cystectomy, nothing else. And now he's quite ready to place the implants. Okay, so the question is, what kind of potential of healing that body had got in those times? Maybe today when he's older, that potential is smaller. I don't know. Look on other girl with big cyst. That cyst came from left to right side. Okay, we suppose that this is odontogenic and fortunately it was odontogenic problem yes but as you see on the right picture there was no bone just paper bone buccally labially no bone to the nose and no bone to on the heart palate aspect so now how to treat it if you have a so big cyst from right canine to the left uh, second Primola. If we will do only cystectomy and we will leave that space empty like the boy before, we can uh, expect that the nose and uh, I will say in, in English, in, in a Latin language, spina nasalis anterior, yes, will collapse. So she will look like a witch, young witch. So and maybe she will lose the teeth. So we decided to do, first of all, canal treatment of that teeth that uh, we were involved in the cyst. And then the next question was, by what kind of material we should fill it? And as I said, this case has got 10 years and again, in those times, there was a problem in my city, in, in Poland, to find, for example, allogenic or allogenic uh, bone or, or uh, frozen bone. It was not so easy because of Polish law. Today is normal, it's a daily surgery. So look, cystectomy, yes, we removed the cyst, we did the apiectomies and we decided to go to the iliac bone and collect um, marrow. Okay, so in special tubes with three compartments and centrifuge, we create, we um, isolate the stem cells from the marrow. Okay, and that stem cells we just mixed with xenograph because xenograft in those times was very famous. And now, now I want to show you the healing and how that healing surprised us, fortunately, positive. This is after one year, what you see, okay? Look, before and after one year. Before and after three years. We can't recognize where's the border between augmented bone and natural bone now. So cool remodeling was done. And this is after three years. And we can see ankylotic connection around the apex. So today, if will, something will happen with that tooth, I'm able to do simultaneous extraction and implantation. So I wish for my patients and your patients the healing of the bone will be so smooth and good. But we know, statistically, it is impossible. Again, I'm asking why. If patient and doctor did everything correct, so where's the problem that we got complications? Not only in 
creating new bone, but in soft tissue too. Or maybe that's why we are looking for the answer, because from time to time, periodontitis doesn't come from only hygienic problems, yes? Maybe it is something immunological problem. We will see. And this is soft tissue healing. We did the cystectomy on the left side. The scar tissue on the right side were done by another surgery in another office. Another interesting thing, I will show you only just for provoke you to thinking. Look, I add the xenograft here and xenograft collapse into the bone and now the ridge has got correct shape. So it was not something like uh, resorption of the graft, but it, it was merged with the bone. Not bone grows into the graft, but the bone invite the graft to itself. And the last case, which is today, to this day, is a nightmare for me. This guy, young guy, has got trauma, and I did in 2009 standard GBR procedure with um, apical sutures to keep the periosteum so close to the graft as I can. Okay, suturing without tension because the mucosa was split from the uh, periosteum, so the suturing was quite easy. After half year, we got quite not profile, but look the strange color of the gums. And look what happened after one year. Nightmare. But no any popcorn, no any one particle was unleashed uh, from beneath the uh, flap. No any purulent problem. Just the xenograft from very famous company. I don't want to say the name. Everybody knows that company. That graft disappeared in 100%. But that young guy was heavy an uh, alcoholist and maybe he took another drugs or something like that. But very, very good student. So now I'm asking myself and I'm asking our master Joseph, have you have uh, same observation and uh, do you want to have answer before surgery what kind of potential of the healing patient has got? So if I will uh, show the scale from 0 to 10 and I will be able to do some tests before surgery and I will see that that patient is in the group from 0 to 3 of potential healing, I will give for the patient information that he is in the risky group, yes? So I could not, I should not to promise him good results. I don't know. That's why we follow you and please uh, keep us updated of, of your uh, point of view and uh, your cooperation with uh, immunological department in Paris. So thank you so much. And now I want to give the uh, voice for Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Radu, uh, for your kind words. You are so humble, but so great. So uh, I'm waiting my screen, maybe, from, uh, from uh, Jerome, because we are still in the presentation of Rado. Okay, then. Okay, so uh, today I will try to, to give you, my friend Rado, some answers. Uh, we will talk about the osteoimmunology and oxidative stress which I believe are the two missing pieces of uh, the osseointegration puzzle. So, uh, this year was a horrible year for everybody, but we learned we learn from the COVID that 
and control inflammation will lead to significant cell dysfunction. We know now what, what is a cytokine storm, uh, what is a fibrosis lung, but uh, during this time where we were stopped completely, uh, I decided to come back to an empty weight page. We are working on bone, but if we want to to enhance our background, we need to understand from the beginning. This is what you said, Rado. And then I decided to to come back to the first step. And for me, the first step is the fracture healing. The fracture healing takes only four to six weeks. And when we do a bone graft, it takes four to six months. This is not normal. It's the same mechanism. And we need to understand why there is a huge uh, gap between the, the fracture and the graft. So how, how it heals? First, it starts by inflammation, initiated by inflow of immune cells, and then the cell they release inflammatory cytokines. After the starting of inflammation, we will see the angiogenesis and the formation of the granulation tissue, which is in bone, the, we name it a soft bone callus. But if we want to achieve angiogenesis, we have two mandatory conditions. The first condition is to have enough antioxidant into the site. And the second condition is we need to activate the repair cell genes. We have in our cells almost 500 genes dedicated only for the repair of the cell, only for the repair. And we need to activate these genes in order to heal. But how to activate these genes? We need a, a factor that we had the information recently, which is the nuclear related factor two. This is the most powerful activator of these genes. And just to give you one information, we know uh, some uh, molecules that are acting on healing, but now we know that vitamin D is able to stimulate in a powerful uh, way the uh, synthesis of the nuclear related factor two. I will come back again about vitamin D. So now, also integration and immunity are strongly linked. This is what we need to remember. We know also integration. You know, this term was uh, wrote by a French uh, uh, surgeon uh, uh, almost 400 years ago. And this science, osteology, uh, is giving us the relationship between the bone cells in order to maintain the bone or to build the bone. But since 2000s, we don't talk again about osteology. The term was replaced by osteoimmunology after the publication of Aaron and Troy. What is osteoimmunology? Osteointegration starts by an immune reaction. This is interesting. And the bone cell activity is controlled by the immune system. And then if we want to map the concept, we will see that all the bone cells, they communicate through the immune system. And this is really a new science. If we want to understand osteoimmunology, we will say first angiogenesis is induced by an immune reaction. All the people are talking about angiogenesis, but now we are sure and we know that if you want, if you want to achieve angiogenesis, you need a good immune system. The immune system is made by cells and proteins, you know, the interleukins, the antibodies, but all of the cells and protein are necessary and mandatory. The immune reaction induces inflammation. This inflammation is always beneficial the first days, but we will never forget 
that if this inflammation is extended, means over a few days, the effect will be reversed and then it will become harmful. And then you understand that any immune dysfunction will have negative impact on osseointegration through the release of inflammatory cytokines and through a specific ligand, which is a rankle. This ligand plays an important role into the development of bones and immune system. Then we need to remember that inflammation must be limited on, in time only few days over those few days it will be harmful how is the immunity immunity depends on the correct operation of the redox mechanism we know that those redox reactions are mandatory for life because it gives us the energy for the cells into mitochondria but this redox reaction will produce oxidant and antioxidant. And in biology, everything is in balance. Oxidant and antioxidant must be in balance. But sometimes the needs, uh, immunity needs production of antioxidant in sufficient quantity. But sometimes we have an excess of oxidant because we produce too much oxidant or we don't produce enough antioxidant. And this negative balance is named oxidative stress. How it occurs? First by redox disease. Diabetes, obesity, cancer, smoking are redox disease. If we meet hypoxia, it will induce production of oxidant. And the same for long-term inflammation. Then oxidative stress will uh, induce a wound healing delayed and a deficient immunity. And this is how the infection is facilitated. And this is why people in oxidative stress, they will meet higher rate of failure and complication. Let's go to one example. We know that these people, diabetics, smokers, they are meeting more complication, more failures. Why? Simply because they are in a chronic oxidative stress. And this is why they have uh, issues in, into healing of soft tissue and bone. Why these patients are in oxidative stress? First, the diabetics. Diabetes is a chronic inflammatory disease. It's not only a, a, a problem of glycemia, but hyperglycemia induces also oxidative stress. And these people are deficient in vitamin D. Smokers, we know now what is the issue. The smoke, the smoke breaks down the antioxidant in the or cavity in the skin in the lung and this is why they they have more uh, cancer in the lung because the lung is in a chronic oxidative stress but we know also that the smokers are deficient in vitamin d high oxida uh, uh, oxidant high level of oxidant they will have a devastating effect on bone inhibiting osteoblast and activating osteoclast. And this is how the remodeling will fail. And this is how resorption occurs. There is only one mechanism, only one mechanism of resorption. It's the failure of the remodeling. But the only one mechanism of the failure of bone remodeling is the oxidative stress of the bone. And then in order to try to answer to one of your questions, my friend Rado, look, we have edantulism. What is the problem of edantulism? People, they don't have mechanical activity. And when the bone is not on mechanical stress, it falls in oxidative stress. And this is why the rich will resolve, only because the lack of mechanical activity 
and then oxidative stress. Remember that the, re the resorption is only coming from the oxidative stress of the bone. So we need to talk about the etiologies. Inflammation, like uh, chronic uh, disease, bacterial contamination, foreign body reaction. We have the redox disease and they have the ischemia. Chronic inflammatory disease, the issue is that there is a continuous release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And this is how the inflammation stays over time. When uh, you have a patient with uh, a chronic inflammatory disease, you must know that the redox mechanism are disturbed and then they are in oxidative stress. We can meet also inflammation after bacterial contamination. But first, we, ne we need to identify what is the issue. First, we have the epithelium. You know that all epithelium in our body, they have only one. The first function is to be a barrier to the bacteria. This is the first function of any kind of epithelium. But in the oral cavity, we will say that epithelium has positive points and negative points. Positive points. First, epithelium has an innate immune function. And the second uh, uh, original function is that the, this epithelium will release high amount of neutrophil. This publication uh, from only a few months showed that in the gum, we have a high number of hematopoietic stem cells. Why? Because into the sulcus of any human, there is a production of uh, uh, polynuclear neutrophil, but how many? 100,000 neutrophil each hour we produce in our circus. But from where the cells are coming, they are not coming from the blood. They are produced by the gum and they go out through the epithelium. And this is why we are able to defend ourselves against the bacteria into the oral cavity. But this epithelium has some negative points. First, this epithelium is contaminated by numerous bacteria. And secondly, in some places, this epithelium is not bacteria proof. It's the case of the junctional epithelium that we know that this epithelium is able to, to, to lead the bacteria to penetrate into the periodontium. And then we will Remember that the epithelium can be a gateway to the graft contamination. How the bone graft gets contaminated? We will say first in per-op. During the surgery, we know that the site is contaminated by the breathing of the patient, by the incision, by the saliva, by the instrument. And then this is how the pathogens, they can invade the graft. But in post-op, the bacteria penetrate through the epithelium. First, because of the needle of the sutured threads. As the thread is large, as the hole is large, and as the bacteria, they can penetrate easily. We know also the, that the braided sutures are not good because the bacteria, they penetrate through this uh, braided sutures. The, the suture does not induce inflammation by itself. It induces inflammation because it allows the bacteria to penetrate into the periodontium. We have a second situation, which is the symbiotype. We know that these people, they are uh, uh, meeting more infection. Probably, and this is uh, the first uh, research that we are doing now, probably because the epithelium in face of this bone resorption is not bacteria proof. And then the bacteria, they can penetrate and to contaminate the bone graft. And the third 
origin is the junction of the flap with the adjacent tooth. All the surgeons, they know this. But why this place is a, a, a dangerous place? Because at this place, there is the junctional epithelium. And then when we raise the flap and we suture the flap, if we don't take care about the suture and the management of the, the closure, the bacteria, they can penetrate into the graft. And this is why, and rather you remember, you, you was talking about apical sutures. Yes, we need to take care about this suture around the tooth, specifically around the tooth. So we got the bacteria into the, into the site and then it induced inflammation. The first cells coming are the neutrophil because they are the main cells for phagocytosis. After one or two days, monocytes and lymphocytes are coming into the site. And then after four days, we will meet only almost macrophages and lymphocytes. What does it mean? It means that at D4, there is no one neutrophil which can defend the site. It means that we need to achieve the healing in only four days. This is why we need to achieve the healing in four days. Otherwise, if we cannot remove the bacteria after D4, then the macrophages and the lymphocytes, they will continuously release inflammatory cytokines. And we know that this long-term release is not good. It will induce a bad inflammation. And the first action of this inflammation will be the stimulation of the osteoclast. In the same time, the bacteria, they invade the osteoblast. And then the osteoblast through the wrinkle again will induce differentiation and stimulation of osteoclast. But it's not finished because this osteoclast will start to release again inflammatory cytokines. And you understand that first, today, we say that osteoclasts are immune cells. They are not only bone cells, they are immune cells, but they will uh, uh, induce a long-term inflammation. You understand why we, mu we must win in four days. Otherwise, we can start to see the complications starting. Then, if we have a long-term inflammation, it, 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 you understand that we will have an oxidative stress. This is the introduction of my lecture. Inflammation induce oxidative stress. Then we will have a deficient immunity. And this is why we will meet more infection. We will have resorption because we activate the osteoclast. But again, this year of the COVID, I understood a lot of mechanism. It will induce fibrosis. And then we understand why sometimes we need we meet fibro integration. Fibro integration follows long-term inflammation from bacteria, from uh, uh, inflammatory material, from uh, chronic inflammatory disease. But you must know that when you get fibrosis, it will never resolve. It's a definitive situation. And then the only one situation for the body is to exclude this fibrosis. You see, after eight years or after six years, you see the, the fibrotic tissue will move out the body. So, how to get contamination? First, because we did not give any antibiotic. We gave antibiotics, but they were ineffective. We gave antibiotic, but uh, it failed to eradicate the bacteria. And the full origin is that the gum contamination is perpetuated through the gingival epithelium. We know that 
when we don't give antibiotics, we will meet more failures, three times more. And why? Because more bacteria, more inflammation, more oxidation. Since this uh, paper from Romandini, uh, the best uh, treatment is to give a single dose of amoxicillin. But it makes sense. Biologically, it makes sense because we, we do prophylaxis. And prophylaxis is active at the time of the contact of the bacteria in the site. Means we need to give the bacteria at high dose at the time of the surgery. After, it doesn't make sense to maintain the antibiotics for several days because it's a prophylaxis. It's not an infectious treatment. The second origin, we gave antibiotics, but they were not effective. Why? Because we know some people, and especially allergic to penicillin, they have a high risk of infection. They have increased risk of site infection, more than 50%. More failures in implantology, failure rate is augmented three to four times more. Recently, a study in uh, Paris, in a big hospital, they found that 80% of failures are patient allergic to penicillin. Then the question is why is the infection rate so high? We can answer now since only few months and year. First, we gave alternative antibiotics, but they are less effective. From this paper in the Lancet, they show that uh, spiromycin, clindamycin, vancomycin, they are much less effective than amoxicillin. In this second paper from Basma and Mish in the JOMI, they found that when they replaced amoxicillin by clindamycin, they met three times more failures. But the main origin is not the antibiotics. The main origin is from the immune response. First of all, allergic patients, they cannot recruit enough neutrophil. And then their defense, their early defense is weak. Allergy is caused by a dysfunction of the immune system. And the responsible is the T lymphocytes. It was the conclusion of the international consensus on drug allergy. And then when the T lymphocyte is in contact with bacteria, it will, it, it will release for long-term inflammatory cytokines. And the third origin is that allergic are deficient in vitamin D. They do not pr produce enough antioxidants. Then from one side, one side you have inflammation. From the other side, we have not enough antioxidant. Then we can say that these people are in oxidative stress. And this is why they are meeting more infection. Take care about allergic patients because they are all in oxidative stress. Prophylaxis fails to eradicate all the bacteria. There is one syndrome that we meet very often in the oral surgery. At the day fifth, patient, uh, patient is meeting pain and swelling. Why? Why at the fifth day? I told you in the beginning, take care. The inflammation must be, the healing must be achieved in four days. Then, if you are meeting pain and swelling at the fifth day, it means that the bacteria are still present into the site. And this is why they induce again and for long-term inflammation. And then they may lead to an oxidative stress. The fourth origin is the chronic gingival epithelium contamination. And then the bacteria, they can spread to the periodontium. It was published in 2010 in the period 2000. Then 
we can see uh, like a site with a gum and the bone graft, and the, 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 the epithelium is not really bacteria proof. Then the bacteria, they penetrate into the periodontium, they stay into the periodontium, but they, they induce inflammation of the periodontium. And then in front of this inflammation, we will meet resorption and fibrosis. This is the explanation that sometimes when we open the site, we see a little bit necrosis, a little bit fibrosis, a little bit resorption. Because at this place, the gum in contact with the graft was inflammatory. And then the gum induce the resorption. The resorption is induced by the gum contaminated. We can take some example and Frank will give us some comments, maybe. We do autogenous, this is the best technique ever. But later on, we have a resorption. After reopening, we see a resorption around the, uh, the screw. We, we can see the, the result is good, but we must understand why this cortical plate resorbs itself. We can see this case from our friend Luca. This is an amazing case, really amazing. Very nice result, but we can see that there is a little bit resorption, a little bit. Just to understand that even if the result is fantastic, we must understand why at some places here not, here yes, at some places we are losing some, a little bit, piece of bone. Sorry. The same, another case with uh, autogenous bone. We see that the result is good, the implant is, but we need to, we are not so happy because we want 100% success. But if we want 100% success, we need to understand why. And this is, one of the explanation is the chronic inflammation of the gum in front of the graft at the surface of the graft. Okay, I would like to, okay. Now, what is the strategy? Can we elaborate a strategy? Then you understand that if we want to uh, reduce the oxidation, we must fight the bacteria. And the only one way to fight the bacteria is to have an effective immunity. That's it. Not, it's not f with medication. And we learned from the COVID that immunity is the best to survive, but also for, for the bone. The goal is to boost and to control the immune response. First, we understand that we need to reinforce the patient immunity. And this is what we did since now more than uh, 15 months to uh, uh, induce a regulation of the immune system, production of antioxidant. And uh, we, uh, uh, we started to test a different uh, product and to elaborate a, a, a very uh, powerful strategy with a combination of different products. But can we uh, uh, use some antibiotics which are uh, doing some immune function? Sorry. I have some issues with my screen. Okay, now. Sorry, now.
I'm sorry because I don't know what happens, but we did a, a, a patient allergic to penicillin. We treated with a combination of spiromycin and metronidazole. And uh, uh, Jérôme, which is one of my best friends, uh, started to make an augmentation, and this is the case. But he called me at, at the six days. Uh, Joseph, we have a monumental infection. A lot of pus when we touch the, uh, the gum. What is your advice? We were in, uh, uh, during the, uh, the beginning of the lockdown, and then I told him, look, I have some, some reflection about this, uh, this issue. Uh, today, in all over the world, we are using azithromycin for uh, COVID treatment. But azithromycin is not active on virus. Virus are not sensible to antibiotics. Why azithromycin is active on the COVID? And then my reflection was, probably azithromycin has an immune function. We, d we didn't have at that time any, any publication about the immune activity of the azithromycin. And then I, I told him, look, let's go to treat this patient, even if we don't have any evidence, and let's go to make a test for two days, just to wait and to see. Then we gave to the patient three capsules of azithromycin for two days only, means six capsules in total, and 50,000 units of vitamin D. After two days, the patient came back for control and the uh, swelling was completely almost disappeared. 90% of the abscess was gone. Then we decided to wait, and after one week, the healing, without any uh, treatment, uh, additive treatment, and then after one week, the healing was complete, and after four months, we opened the graft. We lost a little bit in vertical, but the result was quite good. After a huge abscess, it's a, a good result. And then the implants were placed. But after the, this uh, uh, experience, we were waiting off publication. And they started to come in August 2020. The first publication was a publication from endodontists. <laughs> Unbelievable. And they published that azithromycin is, uh, is active on immune system. And then all the papers started to come later on, inhibition of inflammatory mediator expression, uh, 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 pro-inflammatory cytokine production uh, from azithromycin, etc. And then in March, we started to see that azithromycin is able to inhibit the oxidative stress. This is very interesting. And the last one is very surprising. Now, they are starting to treat chronic inflammatory disease with azithromycin, like lupus. They are giving antibiotics for treating a, a chronic disease. Now, what is the conclusion? Azithromycin is not only an antibiotic, it's a powerful immunostimulant and antioxidant. I'm working on pharmacokinetics because I'm anesthesiologist, and there's two publications were missed by uh, the oral surgeons. It was published almost 35 years ago. And what the which kind of information they are giving us. First, the azithromycin is concentrated into the neutrophil, 160 times more than into the serum. It's unbelievable. We can consider then that uh, uh, polynuclears with azithromycin are like uh, bombs against bacteria. But the most interesting information is that 
the azithromycin is concentrated three times or 30 times more in polynuclear altered, means pyocytes. And this is the explanation why the abscess was gone, because we achieved to treat the infected polynuclears and then they were they, were, uh, they, they got healing and then the pus disappeared. It's interesting to see that. Azithromycin has a long-term effect. One dose persists more than one week, one dose. And azithromycin is a specific anti-inflammatory product against, against gram and periodontium. This is a, a recent paper. So now we can say that azithromycin is very interesting because wide range, long-term, sorry, long-term activity, high concentration, etc. So how to use it? First, we didn't stop, we didn't stop the amoxicillin because we don't have yet enough feedback. We need several years to establish exactly how it works. And then in the meantime, we maintain the amoxicillin, but only one single dose, three gram pre-op, one hour. Azithromycin capsules of 200 milligrams, we have boxes of four caps and boxes of six caps. The four caps, we name it monodose, means we take the four caps in one shot. This is what I do since 30 years. When I have some uh, flu or something like that, I take just one dose in one shot, and then for me it's enough. I use mostly monodose of azithromycin. Then which kind of uh, uh, which kind of protocol we tested. First is when we have simple cases, we use two single dose. One single dose of azithromycin the day before, the night before, and one single dose of amoxicillin one hour before the surgery. Simply, and we do not use any other product. But when we do bone augmentation, we start with the same concept, two single dose. One single dose azithromycin night before, one single dose amoxicillin one hour before. But we, we understood that the main issue when we do bone graft is the contamination of the gum. And then we can use, and this is what we do, we use one single dose each week. D7, D14, D21. All is to reduce the periodontium contamination. This is the issue. The graft after one week must be healed, definitely. Otherwise, it will be it will get infection. But for the long term, we need to protect this graft from the contamination of the uh, the gum. When we use uh, the bone, we can put powder of antibiotics on the, the graft. It could be sticky or not, but we put also a little bit dose of uh, azithromycin and metronidazole on the bone graft before the uh, grafting procedures. We can uh, uh, meet inflammation by a foreign body. We can meet inflammation because the graft is mobile. The granules are mobile. Then we know what is a foreign body reaction it depends on the biomaterial compatibility. It will perpetuate the initial inflammation, and we will say the more compatible the material, the lower the inflammation. And it's obvious that the most compatible is the human bone. This is why it's the gold standard, because there is no immune response when you put a, a human bone into the site. But we have some issues like systematic volume loss when we use the uh, human bone. This is what we can see. We do a sinus and after a while, we see the bone resolves. This is, a, this is the main issue with the human bone. How to avoid this volume loss? 
by adding a low resorbable material, mixing human and xeno, simply. When we mix uh, xeno to human, we have a better stability. But we need to ask which kind of xeno do we have to use? We must talk about compatibility, porosity, and surface condition. The compatibility of the material is uh, 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 made by uh, the material, but we know that the most compatible is the human, but close to the human is the porcine, because the antigenic structure is close to human. And far is the equine and bovine. The surface condition is important. We are very careful about the surface condition of implants and the cleaning. We must be careful about the surface condition of the biomaterials. This is a look how many debris you have on the surface of this material. Even on the bios, there is a lot of debris. Means the cleaning is not perfect. We are using now a material coming from uh, a new company, which is which has a better clinic. It's not perfect, but the cleaning is better. The porosity, the porosity is is made by the channels, the Volkman and the Hovers channels, where the vessel that will go in the, uh, the granule. But when we compare the three kinds of material, we will see that the human and the porcine, they have almost the same size of the, the macro pores. The bovine has very small pores. But when we, we add all these pores, we see that the cumulative space is 10 times less when in the bovine material. So the conclusion is definitely human is the best, but sometimes we cannot use, or we must mix, then the best choice should be a porcine bone substitute. First, because it's, uh, uh, the less inflammatory material because it has the best porosity and it must be sintered, heated. This is how we will achieve the long-term resorption. If it's not heated, if a xeno is not heated, it will resorb fast. And this is maybe uh, uh, the issues that we meet sometimes. Then when we compare uh, 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 there's two materials, we can see that this porcine material has better conditions to achieve uh, less inflammation when we use it. We have also the granule mobility. The inflammatory reaction is induced by the bone callus fragmentation. And then we have two solutions. We use a membrane and we pins, we use pins in order to fix the graft, or we stick the graft itself. This is the concept of the sticky bone. The sticky bone, we use it, we do it with PRF, and then, and this is what said uh, Frank, we must compact at, at, uh, at maximum. The graft must be compacted in order to reduce dramatically the spaces between the granules. And then, as we, use, we are using a, a fibrin liquid, we will fill all the spaces with the fibrin and then we will induce angiogenesis. And this gives me the bridge to talk about PRF. Just a few words. First, about the scientific evidence. Uh, the scientific evidence today is that we are reaching more and more complication every year. And this year we will have almost 400. It means that 20 years after, the interest is still there. It was not a fashion, and today, for sure, with the sticky bone, we have much uh, more action on the bone graft. But I would like today to summarize the there's 1,700 papers. PRF induce angiogenesis. PRF reduce inflammation. PRF induces analgesia because less inflammation. PRF has an antimicrobial effect. It's interesting for the immune response. 
PRF has an osteogenic activity and PRF inhibits osteoclastogenesis. Then, what is my conclusion about PRF? It's not a product with growth factors. The, the uh, true action of the PRF is a powerful antioxidant and then an immune booster. This is why it works and this is why it makes uh, some people happy. And with the uh, sticky bone, we reduce further the bone graft oxidation. This year, and during again the COVID, I found the system to improve the quality and the size of the clots. But recently again, this is POM. POM is the small dog that inspired me since the one year. And this dog is turning all the time when he's, he's waiting the food. And then I designed this new toy in order to make a sticky bone in only a few seconds. Now we can manage the sticky bone in only a few seconds. It will be available, I believe, the next week. We have the redox disease. What does it mean? It means that we must take care about the, um, uh, the level of the vitamin D and cholesterol. I published this paper with many opinion leaders like Fouad Curi, like uh, Tiziano in Italy, Testori in Italy, etc. What was the concept? The concept is that first we must take care about the cholesterol. HDL is a good one, LDL is a bad one. But why the HDL is a good? Because HDL is an antioxidant. Again, we are talking about oxidation. We are talking about immunity. And the bad cholesterol is an oxidant. And then it oxidizes the bone cells. And this is why the LDL cholesterol deteriorates the bone cells. High LDL will induce oxidation of osteoblast. And then the bone metabolism is slowed and the bone is replaced by the fat. It becomes uh, like uh, with a yellowish color. And you remember this guy, Barnemark. Almost 35 years ago, he was saying to his student, when I see a yellow bone, I cancel the graft. Why, professor, do you cancel? I don't know, but I know that I'm meeting too much failures. Today, we can explain why. Because when you have a high cholesterol, the bone becomes yellow. Deficiency in vitamin D is may, will induce a deficiency of uh, 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 nuclear related factor two. And this is why the vitamin D is, has many actions on the bone metabolism, on the wound healing, on inflammation, on immunity. The first action is an endocrine activity. Vitamin D acts as an hormone, but the other are not an hormone action activity. It's a paracrine and autocrine activity. Means the vitamin D acts as a neuromediator. What does it mean? It means that the deficiency on vitamin D will have, will induce many, many issues. But why vitamin D deficiency is so common? We have uh, today in the south of Europe, almost 80% people deficient. In the north, Poland, Germany, we are around 90% deficient, people deficient. But why? We must go back to the beginning of the humanity. All the humans were living naked, without any clothes, taking sun from the morning to the evening. And this is now the modern human. Cap, glasses, bird, clothes. The modern human is not taking enough sun. Simply. And this is why we are meeting so many people deficient. 
and we know the patient systematically deficient. We know them. They are the uh, the old people, the uh, dark uh, uh, skin. You know that in uh, in uh, in US during this COVID time, more than fifty percent of people died from the COVID were Afro American people, African American people, because of the dark skin, because they are so deficient in vitamin D. Obese people are deficient. Depressive people are de deficient. Smokers, diabetics. But smokers and diabetics, they have a double penalty. They have a, an original oxidative stress and they are deficient in vitamin D. So, it's not a surprise when you lose bone when you test the patient to see that the cholesterol is high, the vitamin D is low. It's not a surprise. It's a biologic issue. When you lose bone, take care about the first biology. And you will see that sometimes, this patient, they don't have any possibility to remodel the bone. And then they will lose it, definitely. The recent update, and especially during this COVID year, recommendations are 400 to 600 units a day, but it prevents most of skeletal abnormalities, but it's not enough to activate the paracrine and autocrine pathway. Means it's not enough to activate the immunity. If you want to get a good level of immunity, you mean you need to give them 10 to 12 to 20 times more dose, 4,000 to 10,000 units a day. Since now almost one year, I'm taking 10,000 a day because I wanted to protect myself and my family and all my friends from the COVID issues. Is it an excessive dose? I want to tell you, my friends, definitely no. Because the normal physiology, the normal human physiology is to have to take 10,000 units a day. Want to remind you that when you go to the beach, we are close to the holidays. And when you go to the beach, you must know that you produce this day 20,000 units of vitamin D in one day. Then if you take 10,000, there is no issue. We know that vitamin D serum level until 100 nanogram is normal. Oh, what is the adequate serum level for surgery? Usually we uh, read into the books that normal level is 30 nanogram. It's not enough. For me, we need at least 50 to 70 nanogram per milliliter. And recently the American Endocrine Society Join me to say the best is 40 to 60, but not in surgery. I'm talking about surgery time and surgery patient. Then what is the protocol? First, we need, we need to test all the people. For us, 100 of the people are tested and supplemented. This is the main condition. We will say like the COVID, please test, test, test. Sorry, I'm sorry, I went to... Uh, all right. We test 100% of the patient, like for the COVID. This is how we, we can eliminate all the people. Recently, I got the, this test from a, a doctor in France four nanograms. I never saw in my life this so low level of vitamin D. Definitely, uh, this patient will have a lot of complication. But when we test, even if we test, we supplement them because 30 nanograms is not enough. It means that we supplement all the patients. And when they are diabetics, we add 
vitamin C because diabetics are deficient in vitamin C. We learned from the COVID that we don't need to wait the day of the surgery to give them vitamin D. We need to prepare the immunity. And if you want to prepare it, you need at least seven to 10 days to improve all the immune system. Then we need to start the supplementation one to two weeks before. Minimum for two, three months post-op. When the people are healthy, we give them at least four thousands. When they have some oxidation situation, we give them 10,000 without any discussion. We will remember that we must test systematically before any surgery, cholesterol and vitamin D, in order to evaluate the oxidative stress level and in order to improve the immune system by the supplementation. The last part is the ischemia. Interesting is to, to ask, how does a tissue or bone become ischemic? We have the answer from Mamoto. It was published in Nature. This paper, in a few words, says a tissue under pressure or tension will lose its vascularity. It's very simple. Then, if we want an example, which kind of example? We can take the example of the bed ulcers. The bed ulcers, you know them. What happens? People, they stay on the bed, but they don't move. Then the pressure of the body under the skin will induce a necrosis, mandatory. This is the explanation of the bed ulcers. Then when we have a, a, a tension or pressure, it will induce a hypoxia and then oxidation. What are the situation of tension, excessive tension with oxidation of the soft tissue? We know how it occurs during the primary closure. When we close a site, we induce tension and then oxidation. When we meet some bone loss, the explanation can come from the analysis of the buccal wall. There is no vestibule. And then with high tension, we will see a bone resorption. It's not exactly a peripheral. It's first a bone resorption made by high tension level. Tension not managed during surgery, the bone will resorb definitely, and because the tension will persist over time. This is why we must advise, and the people who are doing surgery must understand that when we, they do a surgery, they must over-release the gun. Not release only to close, they must over-release because we must leave the bone graft comfortable below the flap. We must do apical sutures in order to reduce the tension and the mobility. Because if we pull the lip, we see that even if we made without tension, the lip is the flap are still mobile. Then the mobility of the of the lips of the muscles will induce tension. You see, this is, for example, uh, a case with uh, 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 a classic sutures. But when when we do when we do an apical suture, we see that the the buccal flap is not mobile. Even when we do a lot of uh, 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 big surgeries, you see how the apical suture will immobilize and will. Uh, leave the buccal flap completely non-mobile. We must talk about the pressure on the bone. Who is making the pressure? The soft tissue or the implants with a, an inadapted torque? We know that uh, the concept of surgery without pressure 
we should name it protective bone regeneration. Uh, protected from what? Protected from the gum pressure. And then the Curry technique is the best example of the success of a surgery without pressure of the gum on the soft tissue. But we can use, this is another uh, technique, we can use a, a titanium mesh, we can use a PTFE, a reinforced mesh, we can use a titanium mesh or screws. The concept is the same, and this is why all the techniques are working well. Just using screws will give enough success and frequent success, because we maintain the site without pressure from the gum. Even in vertical, we will see that we can achieve a very nice uh, uh, volume because the screws, the screw tenting will allow enough volume for the bone maintenance. Even in vertical, it will be the same. Means when we do when we do the augmentation, sometimes we will make an incision into the uh, buckle flap. And then we can see how the full volume is filled by bone. The concept is just to stop the pressure from the gum. So the implant. The implant, we know that when we insert the implant into the bone, we, uh, we follow the concept of the primary stability. But should this principle uh, uh, be reconsidered? I'm sorry, because I have some issues with the presentation. Uh, sorry. We need to go back to the bone physiology. What is the bone physiology? The, it's the wall flow. The bone remodeling depends on the mechanical activity. But how is this activity? This activity is cyclic. This is the physiology of the bone activity. All the what we do is cyclic. Then, what is the action from the implant? The action from the implant is a permanent pressure on bone. How the bone reacts to pressure? This, this law exists since more than 300 years. The material reaction to pressure depends on its density. When the matter is flexible, is soft, there is no stress. When the matter is not flexible, it will induce high stress. And this is why when we place an implant into spongiosa, it doesn't induce any stress. Why? Because the, the bone, the, the trabecular bone is flexible. But when we place, and then look at the stability of the implant into a trabecular bone. 10 years after, it doesn't move there is no bone loss because the implant is in full trabecular bone. But when we place an implant into cortical bone, this bone is rigid, and then we will meet a high stress. We must take care about the torque because when we place the implant, the pressure maximal is at the, at the crest at the top of the implant. And this is how we will meet a margin bone loss. The margin bone loss is made mostly by the implant in the cortical bone. When the cortical is sick, it's the same. We will meet cratering because the cortical bone doesn't like the pressure from the implant. Implant in sick cortical, we will see what happens. We will lose all the bone and we will meet a disaster in only a few months. When we meet some bone loss around the implant, we can see what happens. Yes, but when we see the CT, 
which bone resorbs? Always the cortical bone, because only the cortical bone is oxidized by the implant pressure. How to prevent? We must uh, over drill. We must use a countersink in order to enlarge the cortical bone and to meet no contact between the implant and the cortical bone. This is, I believe, the best situation if we want to avoid any oxidative stress of the cortical bone. Or we can place the implant subcrestal. If you place it subcrestal, you will not meet bone resorption. And in bone graft, what is the delight of the surgeon? The surgeon, they like to meet a dense, a very dense bone graft. And this is sometimes why they wait six, nine months, because they want a dense graft. And then they want to, they enjoy to apply a high torque. Definitely, we must stop this behavior because any pressure on the dense bone graft will be fatal. So now we, we can uh, uh, move. The grafted bone oxidize itself when it's mistreated. We must... Uh, uh, first, place the implant with a reduced torque, forgetting any immediate loading. We must forget definitely immediate loading of implant when we place an implant into a bone graft. And we must overdrill the crestal zone in order to do not induce any bone uh, loss at the crestal zone. So we 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 can see we can see uh, some cases we we made with uh, Jérôme Surmenian, my friend, in order to reduce the oxidative stress. Immune supplementation, vitamin D, no inflammatory xeno, over release, tension, pressure, and sutures. So we start for with a simple case, but we don't wait too much. No collagen, and then we don't need to wait more than 2.5 months. But can we reduce the time? Because you remember my reflection was how to manage a, a fracture. Then we go to two months. Yes, it works after only two months. But can we uh, repeat? Yes, of course. We see that uh, uh, when we place this kind of bone graft, reopening at eight weeks, it's large enough. All the graft is, all the graft is uh, completely osseointegrated. But can we uh, repeat again? Yes. We will see that when we do this kind of augmentation, at two months it's enough. But can we do it? Can we do the same without primary closure? Because we know that primary closure induce some tension. Yes. We can use uh, the the bone and cover with uh, uh, with uh, PRF. I know that Rado is using a, 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 a rubber uh, membrane, but the concept is to meet at after a few days a full healing uh, uh, situation. However, with a, a full uh, bone formation. When we don't have enough gum, we can live open today if we manage the inflammation and the immunity. It's not only the antibiotics that are active. We, we manage first the immunity in order to meet a normal and fast healing. But can we reduce the time? Again, yes. Now we are going to open the site after only one month and a half. And then what do we see? At six weeks, the bone graft is completely osseointegrated. But can we go again down, means four weeks? Let's go to see. Extraction, infected site, grafting procedure, preparation, osteoimmunology, uh, uh, um, azithromycin, and then 
this is the situation at one month. But how is the situation when we open? When we open, we see that the bone is dense during the drilling and the implant is placed with 30 Newton, only four weeks. It means that the concept of the fracture healing can be totally uh, uh, compared to the healing of the bone. Not all the situation, but between one to two months. This is the, the closure, again, uh, uh, open flap in order to but let's go to see uh, for bone augmentation, not socket preservation. Can we reopen a vertical bone graft after only two months? The answer is yes, definitely. Even if it's not an uh, uh, autogenous bone, this is again the use of the graft from Pugo. We can see that after two months, the situation is completely healed, but Let's go to see a video. If we see the video, we see how is the bone augmentation at two months. And the drilling, the bone is dense at two months. It's enough dense. And you understand that if we achieve to reduce the inflammation, we can accelerate the bone formation. But can we reduce again? This is another bone augmentation opening at only seven weeks. Management, uh, you see that sometimes we do incision into the buccal flap in order to reduce again the tension. And this is the reopening at seven weeks. Seven weeks means 1.5 months. Then all the bone graft is completely osseointegrated. No collagen membrane, nothing, just immunity. And again, a video to show how is the, the bone volume. So, and this is the aspect after the removal of the titanium mesh. But how is the gingiva? If we analyze the gingiva, we can see that when we do surgery, even uh, large surgery, how is the healing at four days? You remember I told you, we must heal at four days. The picture shows us that the healing was achieved at four days. Another uh, uh, huge augmentation and implant with immediate loading, we can see how reacts the, the gum. We can see that the gum is really non-inflammatory. Even if we have some places still open, but we don't care to leave open some, some places, we see that the gum after three, day, three days is completely healed. And biopsies. We did biopsies too because we need to understand what happens inside. Huge bone augmentation with a, a protective bone regeneration and sticky bone. Then let's go to analyze the situation after four months and a half because of the lockdown. The site, the, the X-ray are quite good. The reopening, again, no collagen member. Again, after four months and a half, we have a full reconstruction of the ridge. Placing implants uh, into the site and making biopsy. Horizontal bone augmentation was in the anterior site. We can see how is now the amount of bone. Sorry, again, I need to go back. So, new bone, 50%. Connective tissue, 20 Then we can go to the biopsy of the vertical bone augmentation. And then we see that we have only 10% connective tissue. Strange, because 
what we learn is that if we don't put the collagen, we will meet invasion of soft tissue cells. I want to tell you that this mechanism is wrong, totally wrong. The collagen membrane function is not to block the soft tissue cells coming into the graft. I can explain you what happens. What is a cell competition? Then, first, how occurs osteogenesis? Osteogenesis occurs with stem cells, and their stem cells, they produce osteoblasts. Now, if we meet inflammation, we will see that the only adipocytes will grow. The stem cells, they will not produce bone cells. They will produce adipocytes and fibrosis. And this is how occurs the soft tissue growth into the bone graft, because again, of the inflammation of the graft, coming from the contamination or from the foreign body reaction. If we want to prevent, we must reduce the inflammation. You know my concept. We must reduce the spaces and to immobilize them. What is finally the role of the collagen membrane? It has some rules. First, first is to immobilize the bone graft. Secondly, I believe that the collagen membrane can be a stop for the contamination from the soft tissue, from the periodontium. Maybe. We must do research. We must uh, uh, search on this way because the collagen, the soft tissue is not coming from the, the cells and the connective tissue is not coming from the soft tissue. And then from my, si from my side, I say to my friends all the time, when you have a thin biotype, please use the collagen because it will help you to reduce the inflammation and the contamination from uh, 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 from the gum. And this is maybe why when we use a non-resorbable membrane, PTFE, why uh, we st how we stop the contamination. But in the same time, we stop the angiogenesis from the periosteum. And this is why the bone growth is very slow, because there is no blood supply from the periosteum. Finally, finally, we must conclude. First, we must be teaching to use autogenous because it's the gold standard. There is no discussion. But sometimes we cannot use or we, we, we don't have the, 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 the use to make uh, harvesting it. And then the alternative solution to uh, autogenous was, is to use a porcine material alone or mix it with human bone in sticky. It will not induce long-term inflammation. It will meet fast osteointegration, and it will allow you to get better bone volume stability. Are we happy? Uh, uh, Rado said we are not happy. <laughs> My friend Rado, me too, I'm not happy because I tried to go to the perfection, but I will never achieve it. Salvador Dali said, don't be afraid to achieve perfection you'll never get it. But we will try with this new association of oral osteoimmunology. We are creating with a lot of friends like Rado, Frank, etc. We will try to, get, to give more explanation and education. Then, to summarize, ischemia and inflammation will induce oxidative stress and immune deficiency. And then, also integration delayed, infection, resorption, fibrosis. Now the also integration puzzle is achieved. Bone tissue is the, the quality is the remodeling, osteogenesis, osteoclastogenesis. But if you need, if you want to achieve a good bone remodeling, you need first antioxidant. But the antioxidant produced by the cells, not by uh, buying in, in, in a store. But in order to get antioxidant, we need to give them to the patient because they don't have enough. 
then with enough antioxidants, we will achieve immunity. And with immunity, you will get the vessels. This is how it works. And if you get the vessels, please don't put any pressure on tension in order to keep them. And finally, to improve the immunity, we need to go to compatibility and motionlessness. My friends, it was a, a pleasure to, for me to share with you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Rado. Thank you, Jérôme, for your host, for your time. I would like to say a special thank to Pugo because they gave me at least 500 papers. And this is how I, 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 I uh, how to say, I shared this year, this year, uh, reading a lot of papers to try to make this puzzle understandable. Many thanks for your attention, my friends. Now we can go to a few questions. Okay, I've got one first question. <laughs> you show us, uh, Joseph, uh, on the beginning of the presentation, you show us the case when you start to save the purulent problem uh, with that case uh, with a 10 technique with one uh, plate yeah. of titanium. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a, that uh, you gave for the patient 50,000 units of uh, the vitamin D. It is correct? Yes. Shit, okay. Yeah, when I love, you know, when I love some people, I, I'm very generous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I understand. That. Okay. <laughs> no, it's, but, uh, it's, it's not an issue because when you give them 50,000, usually uh, there are some people that are using 100,000 each month. But today, the daily the daily dose is better than to give them one, one monthly the dose. Okay. And then 10,000 means 300,000 uh, in a month. But it's better to maintain the dose uh, uh, regularly than to give them one high dose to, to go up and down. I understand. But it helps. It helps. Frank, do you have a question, my friend? Absolutely. Actually, so many. <laughs> So um, I really want to thank you because uh, it was such a uh, yeah, summary of um, yeah, uh, also answers um, to um, yeah, how to prevent complication first and also if you have complication, how to, to solve them. Like uh, yeah. you, were, uh, you covered actually the whole field. Um, um, also, also with the, with the therapy options like uh, acetromycin and and so on, we, where are a lot of uh, studies going on. I think that's also a very interesting uh, topic right now. Um, yeah. So maybe just also to summarize for those uh, of the colleagues who are watching now, uh, practitioners who are maybe just overwhelmed from all these uh, informations. Um, what are actually the take-home messages uh, to summarize it in a few words um, for the daily practice? So first, uh, like diagnosis to check uh, what is the vitamin D level and uh, maybe um, in a very few words, what is the summary for, the, yeah, for a practitioner in the daily practice? Hmm? Uh, my main message today, uh, uh, dear Frank, don't start a surgery without checking immunity. Mm -hmm. How to check? One marker of the immunity is the vitamin D. One, not only, all of them. Then if you bring uh, uh, your patient in a high level, in a high immunity level, it shows that he will get much less infection. He will get more, more fast ocean integration. He will, this is what we see today. We have much, much, much less pain. People, they say, we don't take any painkiller, nothing. We are very surprised. I'm a pain doctor, you know. I'm very surprised because people, they say, even when we do big augmentation, they say, I didn't get any painkiller. What does it mean? There is no inflammation. Why? Because the immune system is working very well. And this is the message. I have one example to give you. Recently, uh, a doctor, a friend called me, said, hey, Joseph, I heard, I heard that uh, you use azithromycin. I met a, a patient allergic to penicillin. 
I gave him azithromycin. But at the fifth day, he got pain and swelling, and at, seven, at the seventh day, he got infection. It means that azithromycin is not, not working. So my friend, my message was, was, first, you must go with high immunity level. Then the antibiotic will be a small help. A small help. The antibiotic is not making the job. It's the immunity. And then with mm -hmm. a good antibiotic, you will achieve a good result. But without immunity, even if you take three kilo of antibiotics every day, it will not work. This is, I believe, mm -hmm. the, the main message. Uh, when you, you use a, a product, try to use a, a low inflammatory product. Because all the time, when you go over this time, four to fifth day, you start into some complication or maybe a little bit failure, but you, you will lose something. We have four days to yeah. achieve success. That's it. It's, it's a really a, run, a, run, mm -hmm. a running uh, uh, situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's very easy to, to achieve it. Very easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a very, very good uh, and important take-home messages for practitioners uh, maybe let's stay so one more question um, we were discussing already uh, when we when we met in in Tehran I remember uh, you were telling me about the epical sutures uh, actually this kind of mattress sutures uh, which I tried uh, so far uh, several times and I, I think it worked uh, quite good um, maybe also for those who are just watching a few more words so um, you also uh, you're not removing them uh, after 10 to 14 days uh, yeah. but you're leaving them actually quite long maybe you can uh, also say yeah. a few more, more yeah. words yeah. to that uh, when 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 you raise a flap the the flap uh, becomes to be mobile and then when when and mobile and then the Angiogenesis, the blood supply is completely stopped because the flap is separated. The question is when the blood supply will come back. The blood supply to the bone will come back when the periosteum will be reattached only. Then how much time the periosteum takes to reattach? Four to six weeks. Four to six weeks. Then my suggestion is to leave the sutures for four weeks at least. Four, four weeks. In order to help the periosteum to reattach and then for the blood supply to come back as soon as possible. And then this kind of apical sutures, they reattach, they don't reattach the, the periosteum, but they make the flap non-mobile. And then the vessels, they can move back immediately to the cortical wound. No bone resorption and uh, better gum sickness. This is again a small mm -hmm. advice, just in order to remove some complication. Interesting, yeah, very good. Four, four weeks and sensible content. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. and, and this is why, uh, of course, braided sutures are totally excluded. We 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 use only monofilament. And you know what, what Fouad is using as sutures, uh, you know the brand. Rado, my friend, another question. Uh, <coughs> so, I just have one, uh, so one more. Yeah. You, you were saying, so supplements, um, you are, we were talking about, talking about uh, vitamin D. You were also saying um, in a few cases, vitamin C. Are there any <coughs> more supplements? Yeah. You oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, are, there are, um, actually, we have uh, 12 supplements. 12. We, we are testing them since now more than one year. And uh, what is the, uh, the, the feedback? First, first, the patients are very happy. They ask us, please give me more. We say we cannot because the company doesn't give us too much because it's in, in uh, we, are, uh, we are in a confidential situation. First, they they like it. They feel much, much better. <coughs> and today we know that we have some supplement like omega-3, like uh, probiotics. There are a lot of products that help 
the immune to work well. And this is what, what we were testing since now 15 months, is to establish a protocol. We have the protocol now. Uh, the, the product will be uh, uh, available in September, but definitely it's a huge uh, uh, paradigm shift for the future. To understand that any people that we want to manage the boom must be managed in immunity. Mm. I would like to to add just one comment, because uh, I I believe that in the in the chat there are a lot of questions. I would like to uh, it would be the the, the last uh, topic uh, about preimplantitis. A lot of people they talk about preimplantitis. From my point, biology point of view, uh, the preimplantitis starts with two mechanisms. Two. The first mechanism I uh, showed it is when you place an implant with too high pressure on the cortical bone. Then the bone resorbs. The bone induces an immune reaction with oxidative stress and with bone loss. Then when you lose the bone, the bacteria, they can penetrate into the site in order to induce a chronic inflammation. The second origin of the periimplantitis, and we know that a lot of periodontists, they uh, say all the time in the lectures, you must take care about periodontitis when you place implant because you must first treat the periodontitis before implant placement because people, they have a lot of bacteria. But we have the experience, you and me and other, and Arado for sure, that when we have, and maybe I'm joining link of issues in this kind of topic. When you have a very good soft tissue around the implant, the bacteria, they cannot penetrate. You will never meet perimplantitis in this case. The, the situation is that the concept of zero bone loss from linkage issues is true, but it's because the bacteria, they cannot move in. The sickness is very important in order to reduce the inflammation. When they have a poor soft tissue, the preimplantitis will start from this direct contamination. And definitely when they get bacteria into the site, it will stay for many years. You cannot remove, you can remove the, the chronic inflammation. It's impossible. And this is why mm -hmm. when we meet perimperantitis, we have to remove the implant. A, a lot of people, they try to rebuild. It's a nightmare. It's better to remove the origin and to restart with a biologic treatment, etc. Et uh, thank you, my friend, my friend Frank. <laughs> It was very, very nice for me and uh, Rado to share with you this very uh, interesting moment. We will meet soon because now we have in charge the Association of Oral Osteoimmunology. And for sure, next year we will show very, very nice research for one pleasure to get people happy after their treatment. Thank you, Frank. See you soon. Thank you, Rado. Thank you, Jérôme. Thank you. Now, thank you. Uh, Actually, I have, a f I have a few questions for you. Yeah, thank yeah, you for yeah. If you agree. Um, some, somebody asked, I use intravenous vitamin D uh, or drip therapy to tackle the oxidative stress. What is the professor's opinion? I'm not aware about intravenous uh, vitamin D. I didn't know that vitamin D was injectable. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. Uh, and uh, we are managing. I'm managing vitamin D since more than 25 years because in pain clinic, the first question that we ask the patient is, give me your uh, vitamin D test because we know that vitamin induces a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't have experience and I don't know, I'm not aware about this uh, solution. Do you have any other questions? Yeah, actually I have. Um... Three of them. Uh, what are your thoughts about in office vitamin D tests? In office. Uh, in the office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it's popular in some countries because, uh, for example, in Denmark, Denmark dentist is not allowed to to prescribe a, a vitamin D test, a blood test. Can you imagine this? 
people they do bone augmentation, but they are not allowed to to order a, a lab test for the patient. Then they have the solution. It's better than nothing. This is my. It's better than nothing. Okay. But definitely, I will prefer the 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 lab test. Okay. Uh, I have also one question. Um, is there a benefit to use corticosteroid as a prophylactic treatment to struggle with um, the oxidative stress? Yeah, definitely. Because uh, 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 back, back, back 20 years ago, when I learned implantology, we, we were, it was said that uh, it, corticosteroid were, were kind of mandatory with, of course, antibiotics. And uh, we prescribed we prescribed them uh, for for three days uh, after the surgery, and sometimes yeah. sometimes even the day before the surgery. Uh, we were using uh, steroids uh, since that time because it reduced the inflammation. But the problem is that today we are reducing the steroids. We are used only one day, and we see that there is no more inflammation because. Uh, w uh, uh, Steroids are used because there were there was a lot of inflammation, and when you stop the steroids, immediately you have the patient showing pain and swelling. But uh, my objective is to reduce the the steroids uh, treatment to one shot again because I, I like this concept one shot to be effective and for uh, definitely. But this is something streamlined. I mean, this is something you you do for every patient. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I advise to give uh, steroids for all the patients, definitely, okay. helping them to reduce the inflammation. But now we give them three days at least. But it's too much for me now. We are testing one day. In, uh, it's enough. Okay. And I do have one last question. So when you have a high vitamin D uh, deficit, so you give. I understand that you give a daily dose of vitamin. Uh, how much time and when do you test? Do you test again after a certain time? Yeah, I like this question because when I meet a patient deficient, my first, my first sent sentence is, do you know that now, since now, you will take vitamin D for the whole life? Because when they are deficient, why there will be uh, no deficient in six months or in one year? A patient deficient will be deficient for the whole year, for the whole life. And this is why I ask the, the doctors to test. We must make a diagnosis because it will be a treatment for the life. First, for the treatment, because after three months we say it's the MD, the physician who will take care about the vitamin D, the dentist must take care of the three months. But he must give the information to the patient, take care, it's for the life. Okay, so no risk of, of uh, overdosing. We, we need. God made, uh, made us, if you believe in God, <laughs> God made, uh, made us uh, with a synthesis of vitamin D after sun exposure. That's it. We must go to the sun. Okay. O otherwise, you take one pill every morning. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure and, uh, and a real honor to, to host you, uh, all the three, uh, three of you. And um, so take care and uh, thank you very much again. And um, I hope to, to meet you soon. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, all my friends. See you soon. See you soon. Bye. Bye.